Hi, my name is Keegan Flegner. When I was in first grade, I was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. Since then, sports have played a huge role in helping me to cope with the mental and developmental challenges of being on the spectrum. So I want to help show the world that all kinds of sports can help all kinds of people with all kinds of challenges. Welcome to Sports on the Spectrum. My guest today is Jamal Hill. When Jamal was 10, he was diagnosed with Charcot-Marie Tooth, a hereditary neurological condition that can result in progressive loss of muscle tissue and touch sensation in the body. Despite this severe medical challenge, Jamal has persevered to become one of the top Paralympic swimmers in the world today and is now a Speedo-sponsored 10-time national champion and Paralympic medalist, winning bronze in the men's S9 50-meter freestyle event at the 2020 Paralympics in Tokyo. Out of the pool, Jamal founded Swim Up Hill, which works to provide swim instruction to middle and low-income people around the world to help lower the risk of drowning, with the goal of teaching 1 million people how to swim annually by 2028. This initiative has earned Jamal much recognition, including being nominated for the Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award at the 2023 ESPYs. Please join me in welcoming Jamal Hill to Sports on the Spectrum. So thank you so much for being with us today. Um, so in order to get things started and get the ball rolling here, I'll, why don't we start off uh, at the beginning of uh, your life, as I like to always do. And uh, my first question here, I guess, will be, what are some of your first memories of sports? First memories of sport have to be um, swim lessons, mm -hmm. mommy and me, uh, so swim classes, mommy and me. And then um, other than that, it would probably just be being a kid in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, I was an only child, but we had... I can relate. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Shout out. All right. Well, yep. me and Mr. Fleekner, only children. Um but yeah, just growing up as a kid in the neighborhood, there were uh, we had a lot of kids in my neighborhood growing up, and um, our house, you know, we had a basketball court at our house. We had like all the toys and the playground in the backyard, so everyone would be there. So I mean, you know, I think um, when we talk about sport, that's really it, right? It's it's really playing, right? It's a game. So those are my earliest memories of sport, just being a kid in the backyard in my neighborhood with all the other neighborhood kids. No, man, look, I, I can uh, I can relate in some ways. I yeah. actually, I didn't grow up in a neighborhood where we had like the backyard, um, you know, basketball hoops or stuff. I had to go to a gym to actually oh. shoot a basketball. <laughs> yeah, but um, sure. but, you know, like um, I relate to you with the swim classes. I don't think I did mommy and me, but like I I, I actually did take swim lessons at an early age. Um, So, you know, I'm right vibing with you right there. And in, and just with the basketball, like the, like that's my main sport or the one I certainly love the most. So it's like you know, shooting hoops and all that stuff, you yeah. know, even in a casual manner is just, that brings back so many good memories for me. Um, I guess now, um, you know, you talk about your first memories and and that's great. Um, but obviously you being here, you're a very accomplished athlete. Um, um, so I would ask, what are your, some, some of your favorite memories from your own sports experience? Some of my favorite experiences from my own sports experience, um, Probably being a kid on the swim team, uh, really multicultural environment, uh, early mornings, um, cups of noodles and cups of noodles is like <laughs> a memory from swimming. Oh. Uh, tons of cups and noodles. Mm. Um, yeah, that 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 was always really fun. I think about, I think about high school. I think about like winning. Uh, winning my race in the district championships um but not being fast enough to qualify for state championships mm. and and how that experience really kind of shaped me and molded me in a way to um to just to, to you know to be like go ahead and tuck it you know tuck it in right uh uh and and uh really just kind of give things my all all the time and, and live with no regrets um, I think about, man, I think about, I think about training. I think about training with, you know, incredible athletes, uh, like, uh, Ryan Lochte. I had a chance to train. Oh, wow. Training. I know who that is. There you go. He's, he's a household name, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I had a chance to train to, even despite his shenanigans, I had a chance to train with him in the pool. Um, 
So I think about my career as a professional and just kind of some of the earlier years. Uh, and, and just like the loneliness of it, you know, like the mm. emptiness of the space, it would be me, it would be a coach. Um, and I had one teammate and it would most days, you know, at 7am, it would just be us, um, for days and weeks and months and years until I would finally have my, my, um, you know, kind of like my coming of sport moment. And uh, accepting and coming out of the closet about my disability and, and have an opportunity to compete as as a Paralympic athlete. But, but those are some of my favorite memories. Yeah, I mean, you know, those those definitely sound like great moments. And by the way, you know, for both you and for my for the viewers here, basically all my knowledge of swimming comes exclusively from like the Olympics, which is where okay. I know the name Ryan Locke from. So okay. I'm I'm just I'm just getting it out there. Like I'm not a oh, certified swim expert per se okay. um but I'm, I'm trying my best man I'm, I'm trying my best the fact that you said that name actually was kind of cool so you know yeah, yeah, that's what it's about man yeah i think i think it's safe to say like 90th percentile of the population their experience of swimming is the olympics and probably you know short of this generation you know not even this generation this generation still knows michael phelps um our generation or you know they or we're aware of Michael Phelps, Ryan Locke, the end of the generation before they could probably name Mark Spitz, maybe, right? But like right. Michael I know Phelps about is still too. kind of the, 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 there you go, right? So that name still holds bells. But yeah, the reality is there's only any given time and there's, there's you know, Olympic, Paralympic athletes swimming or not, the few names that you know are probably going to be the few people that uh i won't even say like i've been able to get rich but have been able to turn it into a real living you know something respectable that would allow them to provide for their family you know so uh it's uh it's it's interesting it's 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 an interesting path not at all what what i think most people imagine it's like well no look you know i i totally get what you're saying about how there are just a lot of sports out there that don't get much attention aside from you know those brief moments often at the olympics like for example in addition to basketball i'm a volleyball guy and volleyball it doesn't really get a lot of attention outside of the olympics and yeah. occasionally at the college level yeah. and even for and it's interesting actually because yeah. in volleyball there's a disparity um between how popular it is between men and women in that it's a lot more popular for women like right now they're about to have the uh the championship games and those are going to be on espn and all that stuff whereas the men i mean they just they don't have that kind of popularity so it's just it's it's kind of interesting to see but i totally understand what you're saying about how ideally as you know the the sports industry continues to grow that more athletes like you will have greater opportunities to do what you love and turn it into something you know that you can keep doing for a long time, you know. Fingers crossed. I'll tell you this: I'll definitely watch a women's volleyball game over a men's volleyball game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't blame you. They are I'm very good. The they are very good. I'm not discrediting them. I'm, I'm just, just saying. I'm part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. Uh, but even even with volleyball, though, you know, again, I only know a little bit about a little bit about this. But the way I understand it, it is also they're, they're actual leagues, right? Over yeah, team, right. Like they're just not very noticeable, right? you know. Not noticeable, but at the same time, like they do provide a space for someone to, right, like earn a modest living, right? Yeah. They do what they love, right. You know, yeah. so even volleyball, I mean, this is not, uh, I'm in agreement with what you're saying, but I just want to also put it in context. Even that is in like its own kind of league and lane right there alone, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, like swimming, at least on the Olympic side, able bodied athlete side. They do have a world tour. They do have things, these competitions where, right. In some ways, I guess it's similar to golf, right? Like you can go and you can compete, um, but not at all similar to golf in that. I, guess, I mean, like, golf makes millions of millions. money. Like you talk about oh. live golf now. It's like, it's yeah. taking over the industry with like millions. money, money, money. You know, it's like, if you're good enough to make it into the competition, even if you come in last, you're still going to get a check. Right. Right. Uh, but that's not the reality. This is like a very harsh, like first, second, third. And then it's like all first, second, and thirds are not created equally, obviously, because it's not just one race, right? It's not just one right. goal competition. There are multiple disciplines. There are obviously 
different it's different gendered right mm -hmm. so, but like it's two genders in one competition where obviously again in volleyball or, or golf you don't experience that right it, they're, they're different settings but i don't mean to get down a rabbit hole here man no 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 and i'll actually draw a little bit of comparison although i i'm hoping i, I don't offend you here in that um okay give it to me um <laughs> when i was a freshman in high school i actually ran track for one mm -hmm. year and like similar to swimming track is a sport where it's dominated by individual competition mm -hmm. and you know the all these different events that it's just like you kind of you have to pick a lane and then you hope you have to do well obviously at a high school level that that pressure doesn't exist as much but yeah. you know as you go up it's like it it grows and so you know i think for me at least when i was doing that for one year i was kind of trying to figure out you know it's like first of all do do i want to keep doing this but second mm -hmm. of all it's like what level do I need to compete at to consider it a feasible venture, you know? And ultimately for me, that wasn't the case, but that was more just because I'm not as much into track as things like volleyball and basketball. Mm. But, you know, it was, it was an interesting endeavor, you know? And I think it opened my eyes at least a little bit as to the reality for those who actually do want to do this for further sure, down the road. Yeah. I think you're spot on, man. That, that definitely, that experience I think is, is in the, um, it's in the like general experience wheelhouse, right? Like that's something mm -hmm. that a lot of people can definitely relate to. Yeah, no. Well, I think now, um, you know, we talked briefly about, you know, swimming coming up, but let's talk a little bit more about that now. And why don't you give me a timeline of how it started and, you know, where you are today? As I understand it, you run your own foundation called Swim Uphill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want a timeline on Swim Uphill? I'm sorry, what? You want a timeline on Swim Uphill? Sure. Okay, for sure. So, uh, so my pill was founded. Uh, really, so I've been, I was a lifeguard, first job ever, you know, 14, 15 years old, county, LA County lifeguard, um, you know, working in the community, obviously, uh, but also good job. I got to swim. Oh, man, excuse me. I got to save lives. Um, you know, right. Save lives. <laughs> I lives, mean, right? that's a very, so, ultimately, like, term. you know, I got to be, you know, a part of the system that saved lives, right? Like yeah. a very clear, definitive, preventative measure, ultimately, right? Um, and 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 uh, uh and um, I was an EMR, an emergency medical mm, response. I know what that is. Right? Ultimately, yep. um, but that was good. Did that for for like I said, almost ten years, and uh, really started doing the work around some uphill in twenty. 18 uh, when I won my first national championship in the Paralympic movement for Team USA and um, ultimately originally we had uh, sparked this partnership with a company called Swimply uh, who ultimately like the Airbnb of swimming pools so that they like uh, they market and sell swimming pools from residences right they sell a portion of people's property for a certain amount of hours right they rent it out uh, so we struck this deal that a allowed us to come into an area in um, really kind of in the heart of um, really kind of in the heart of black Los Angeles, the heart of African LA and uh, contract these homeowners who had pools and ultimately work it so that the youth in that community could stay in their community, build community with their neighbors um, and also receive, obviously, swim education, uh, not just a life-saving skill, but a life-empowering skill, right? Maybe not in their own backyard, but in the backyard right down the street. Um, so that's really kind of how it started. And 2020, we really made it official. We put our paperwork in. We became a 501c3. Mm. Uh, you know, um, people say nonprofit. I like to call it a for-purpose organization. Uh, yeah, I, really I know there, what you're talking about here. Yeah, man, 100%, buddy. Um, you know, so I call it a full purpose organization. So that was a big milestone 2019, 2020, COVID-19 happened. That was a huge milestone for us as an organization because uh, the core principle behind our, our mission is to be teaching the main people around the world how to swim every year. Uh, one of the core tenements of that is our offering that allows people to begin their swim education without the need for a pool. So they can begin their swim education with a bowl, a bench, and a bucket, simple household items, and clean water. Um, with such an innovative and simple idea, we were able to have a deal with Airbnb during COVID-19, or ultimately we were providing these virtual experiences to hundreds of families um, across six out of seven continents. So 
uh, that was a really, really big platform for us to launch off of. And it introduced a lot of people to us. Uh, and then you roll into 2021, obviously that being a Paralympic year, um, us getting a lot of press surrounding that partnerships with Speedo, you know, every year, even to that point, we were teaching just on the ground, 500 uh, youth how to swim. Uh, that That's hands on outside of our partners to, you know, you come into 2022, uh, we launched our first international program. Um, our curriculum is now being circulated all the way to now 2023. Uh, we've become a national YMCA approved partner, only one of six partners in the entire country, you know, so yeah. we're, we are a curriculum that YMCA aquatic staff, all 32,000 clubs across the country now have an option to subscribe to as an additional resource when it comes time to recertify and things like that. So uh, those are, you know, a few milestones, though, I guess the big one this year also was that as the founder this year, I was acknowledged by the ESPYs, right? The the premier. Oh wow! The premier, right? You know that everybody knows. That. <laughs> yeah, everybody right? knows the ESPYs. <laughs> the Grammys of sports. Yeah. Um, so I was acknowledged as the founder, um, and nominated for the Muhammad Ali Sports Humanitarian Award at the ESPYs this year. So, all those things really just kind of go and and I guess even more again, like even me as the founder, I I'm a part of the United Nations. I represent uh -huh. um, a cohort of young leaders with the United Nations, 17 top young leaders around the world who have a two-year stint in the office of, of youth, the Youth Envoy office. Um, and again, all that really has come by way of not only me being obviously a successful professional athlete and swimmer, but also having, you know, quite frankly, great success um, in the field of philanthropy impact and creating a sustainable for purpose business. I mean, look, you know, I, I mean, my mother, she works with these types of organizations. So mm -hmm. I've gr gained a lot of knowledge over how these things work. And what you're yeah. describing is exactly the kind of model that, you know, makes this kind of impact. It's like, you know, you're not obviously trying to do this for the purpose of money, but you're creating a sustainable model that's going to help more and more people down the road in honestly a very innovative way, you know putting them in other pe in people's backyards. It's like, that's a great way to, you know, make them feel at ease and trying to learn how to swim. You know, mm -hmm. um, I didn't have that, but you know, I still learn. I mean, you talk about partnering with OMCA. That's where I learned how to swim. So it's, uh, it's like you and me both. Yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's like finding ways to outreach to people, you know, that you're trying to get to yep. in these kinds of ways. It's like, it, it yep. really works, you know, and it leads to things like, you know, getting nominated at the SBs. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, I didn't see that when I read your website. It, it's like, you yeah, know. I got I got to update. I got to update my personal <laughs> side. I do. I got to update my personal. I need like a media page on my personal Yeah, yeah. Side. No, I mean, I, I'm doing the same thing with this podcast right here. So I feel you on that, man. Um, but that, no, that that's great, man. The, the swim uphill. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's just... Uh, the way that's structured and and what it's contributing to that's that's very good why don't you actually talk a little bit about like the the the, the overarching cause like why, why you're so passionate about it yeah ultimately man it just comes down to you know when we look at the world's problems um and even you right you spoke to your mom she works with nonprofit. she works in the for-purpose space mm -hmm. um no one person or one group is gonna you know fix the world right like the world will always be the world but i think at best we can really focus and 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 highlight maybe just one thing big or small uh that we think can actually be solved um and, and at the heart of our mission to teach a million people around the world how to swim every year is really actually accessible education uh because around the world these hundreds of thousands these close to millions of people that drown um, you know, we're not just talking about your neighborhood pool drowning. These causes obviously range from boat rides to natural disasters to there's there's a myriad of, of, of ways that these aquatics disasters and tragedies are happening. But the one thing that remains is that the people experiencing them and ultimately falling at the greatest amount of victimhood don't have the education on how to swim or survive or really be able to take care of themselves in any aquatic environment. Uh, so that's really what it, that's at the heart of it. It's not just about saving lives, like I said, it's about empowering lives. Um, 
and how how even you having this podcast right like you had to have a high level of of self-belief right in your abilities to even take the steps to launch it to even reach out to not just somebody like me right <laughs> anybody right we're, we're all just people and so that's the gift that we're giving these students whether they be school-aged children or they be adults with school-aged children or they be adults who have adults <laughs> who have school-aged children right yeah um yeah it's about just taking that seat and being like hey I thought I couldn't do this matter of fact when it comes to swimming not only did I think I couldn't do this but there's a lot of stereotypes and stigmas that I can't do this and that I shouldn't be doing this and that this is not a space for me whether that is verbal or I see it in the world uh, so what does it look like to go ahead and put that in someone's hands and say, hey, listen, this is not rocket science. We can unlock this for you. Actually, but with, with just a little bit of work and concentration and the, and the right tools um, and let them have that power and, and start to own this. Yes, I can. I am capable. And what effects that really is going to have to someone's psyche, which we know drives ultimately the trajectory of their entire life and the lives that will spring from there. So that's what it's about. It's about empowering lives, helping people to connect with themselves and their community through water. No, man, that is, that is honestly one of the best kind of explanations, not just to th this cause itself, but to any cause in general, <laughs> you know, you talk about it, like that's a big reason why I have this podcast here. It's, it's about, you know, I'm not trying to solve the world. I'm just trying to make it a little better and, a way that I think is important to me and to a lot of people, you know, and I, honestly, like going to your cause now, like you talk about, you know, s preventing people from drowning and stuff, which, by the way, I had a distant family family member um, who actually died from drowning um, because he didn't know. Yeah, he didn't know, like not. He, and it wasn't even that he didn't know how to swim. He just he didn't he was in the ocean and like a riptide happened. It's like those kinds of mm -hmm. things that people don't know which aren't hard to learn about it's like they can have a real impact and you know you know we it that may not seem prevalent in developed countries you know you talk about this is not your your casual backyard pool accident it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's a worldwide issue that meets a lot of people um and affects them and so just like by doing something that honestly isn't that too difficult you know you're actually making a real impact and i guess um now you know you talk about how there are stereotypes that say you can't do this. Why don't we talk about some of your stereotypes? And so why don't we mm. discuss, um, uh, please, um, I apologize if I don't pronounce this correctly, but I'll try. So you have uh, what's okay. called Charcot Marie Tooth. Did I get that right? You were just a syllable off, right? Okay. So Charcot. Charcot, Charcot thank Charcot you. Charcot Marie Tooth, right? Charcot so Marie Tooth. There, scientist. Yep, there you go. That's that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll call it CMT though the rest of the way to keep it simple. Um, yeah, but, great. yep, but let's discuss CMT and well, let's start with first of all, what is it? Because until I interviewed you, I didn't know what this was. And why don't you discuss mm -hmm. also how does it affect people? Do they feel it every day or only on occasion? And is it more prevalent in certain circumstances and how, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, CMT is a peripheral neuropathy. Um, what that means is that it ultimately affects mostly the extremities of the body, right? So for me, mm -hmm. it affects um, from my knees to the soles of my feet, I have zero percent nerve capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. So it feels like I'm walking on my knees at all times. And then from my elbows to my fingertips, it affects me at about 30 percent nerve capacity. Uh, when I speak about CMT and I speak about the larger neuropathy field and we talk about looking for cures for these things, one of the greatest challenges is that exactly what you said um, neuropathy, there's no picture in people's minds for neuropathy, right? Now, there's a hundred different types of cancer, okay? And you don't have to know, you know, you don't have to know all these hundred different types, but cancer has a very clear image in your mind, Yeah. right? So when we talk about cancer funding and cancer research, obviously, we all need to find cures for all these ailments, but people have a clear picture. They're like, oh, no, that's, that's not good. That's serious. When we talk about neuropathy, which quite frankly is one of the most common um, and really one of the most uh, debilitating diseases that afflict all of humanity, whether it be Charcot-Marie Tooth um, or more commonly known forms such as cerebral palsy, things like this, these are all neuro neurological conditions ultimately. 
there's no clear picture in people's mind when they think about neuropathy, right? You think about right. cancer, you think about somebody's body wasting away, them looking sick, being in a hospital bed. And, you know, unfortunately, we also think about cancer as death. When people think about neuropathy, well, you know, it's just as sinister. It just looks a little different. What that looks like is, you know, a far diminished quality of life for most people. Um, they, they don't waste away kind of all of a sudden. They live a life of wasting away, um, a life of lack of ability. Um, and 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 quite frankly, death never comes to relieve them, right? Hmm. Uh, it just it, it's this increasing state of dependency and less relationship with your own body. You really you begin to become a prisoner. You become to come trapped inside uh, with with the inability to express your words or your emotions or your actions through physicality in any way, shape, or form. So that's really what neuropathy, that's what the neurological and neurological disease experience is like. Um, uh, like I said, for me, it manifests uh, from my from my knees to the soles of my feet, from my elbows to my fingertips. Uh, a lot of people who live with this neuropathy, they're partially wheelchair bound. Um, they have to wear leg braces and things like that to support their skeletal structure. Uh, in order to stand or even again just do things that uh any average person from the perspective of physical capability would take for granted right uh so so that's that's really what it looks like buddy no i mean it's actually interesting because you talk about how like when people hear the word cancer they like an nc reaction comes to mind whereas with neuropathy you know it's a little different like for me one one of the terms that lies with me a lot is neurodiversity and obviously within that that context you hear the word diversity and and obviously when people talk about diversity they talk about being black they talk about being white they talk about being hispanic they talk about a lot of those things but in terms of like you know having autism or having adhd or having any of those kinds of things that usually doesn't come to mind unless you add in neurodiversity but at the same time, when you say that, people are just like, what is that exactly? You know, mm -hmm. so I think it's 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 kind of interesting. You know, you talk about like having, you know, this obviously very of uh, 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 impactful di disease um, that, you yep. know, does these things for you that are really hard. But it's like, you know, for a lot of people, including myself, I'll admit, because, again, I didn't know about this before I I look I looked into you. It's it's like you know we we're just we're trying to understand like we're trying to increase the the scope of how many people understand what this is and thereby hopefully do more to have a uh, make it less bad you know or whatever mm -hmm. and I guess actually mm -hmm. you know for the, obviously there's only so much people uh, aside from us can do about what we deal with um, so that means we have to do a lot in ourselves and you've done that obviously in the form of swimming. And so what I'd like to ask you, how does swimming specifically help you to better understand or address CMT? Yeah, uh, well, swimming water in itself is just, it, it, we, we all know this is science speaking. Water is a healing medium, just as destructive as it can be. I mean, as dangerous as it can be. Uh, you know, it gives life, right? All of us have a relationship with water. All of us have a healthy relationship with water. Actually. I mean, people right? need like, water to live, you know, it, it's like start there, live, you know? So we all have an existing healthy relationship with water or right? maybe not always kids. They're like, no, give me the juice. But even that juice <laughs> is made of water, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it um, all comes um, back to water, even if they refuse to admit it. It all comes back it. to water, right? Uh, so there's that. And then outside of that, uh, just when we talk about hydrostatic pressure and things like that, what that does for circulation within the body, um, what an aquatic environment allows for in terms of movement, right? Not having to abide by uh, the forces, the, 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 the forces of gravity that are exerted on air, having that freedom, having lift forces experienced in water uh, provides people again with there it's it's a therapeutic modality just being in water um having your body constantly squeezed and again i know that goes not only for physical disabilities but even for a neurodiverse community um you know i know a lot of therapies are centered around water because of that the tactile right and having that kind of hug that pressure at all times uh, it provides a certain 
it, you know, you know it, it's no different than um, being coddled as a child, right? And, and receiving a hug or, or being soothed. It, it has a soothing effect on the body and the psyche. Um, so that that's really it. When I even even to this day, when I come across uh, people living with shark memory tooth who are doing really well with their disease, they have some type of aqua aerobic or you know some type of aquatic regimen built into their lifestyle. They go to the pool, they go to physical therapy. They're spending time in the water, and they're ultimately you know, though they may not be able to rebuild these neurological connections, in some ways they're building new pathways, right? Um, that 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 may or may not 100% translate onto land, uh, but but that still have their benefit in, and 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 really are are, are positive experience in all their own. No man, I mean, you know, I mean, I'll tell you this, like. As someone who plays sports, like I should ha have been more prone to this, but I was lucky in that I didn't suffer many injuries that, you know, limited my mobility for any sense of time. But with a lot of athletes, as I'm sure you know, if whenever they get like, you know, ankle sprains or torn muscles, you know, or broken bones, it's like as part of that recovery process, they often go swimming themselves because, as you oh, said, 100%. for people who are disabled, whether temporarily or permanently in any way, the water acts is a great medium to help them move those body parts that, you know, just, exactly. just exactly. kind of, you know, wouldn't function without that, that, you know, pressure around them. And for me, actually, too, I'll point out, like, I was never someone mm. who used swimming to help with uh, my autism. But something I, I would often do and still do, actually, is I have a bunch of like those tiny balls. And often I'll take them and I'll squeeze them with my hand. And the reason that's helpful mm -hmm. is because it allows me to get some of that internal pressure, you know, building within my mm -hmm. body that just wants to exert energy and put it into mm -hmm. something that, you know, doesn't it, it come close to equating to just jumping up and running around the room, you know, constantly, you know, yeah. it's like, it's, yeah. it's much more helpful, honestly, to, you know, just kind of find another way to, you know, figure out um, how to deal with, um, an issue that, you know, or I would call it actually a challenge that just, you know, needs to be addressed, you know, in, in a way that, yeah. you know, is simple and yet effective. And so I think that's kind of, you know, for you using uh, the water and thereby swimming to help you with that. Like, I think that's very interesting to hear. Um, and I, and now actually, um, I'd actually, this is actually interesting. I've never had this opportunity before, and I'm actually really curious because as someone um, who hasn't isn't a Paralymp Paralympian or competes in those kind of events, mm -hmm. whenever I play sports, I often always play it against people who are, you know, mm -hmm. normal mentally or physically or whatever. So I've never really had the opportunity to play against other people who are autistic or have n other neurodiversity conditions. And so I'd ask, um, uh, in your opinion, how does the experience of competing against people with conditions similar to yours compared to competing against others who don't have them? Uh, put it very simply, yeah, it's going to be a more even playing field, um, a more even playing field on the professional level, right? Like uh, even me competing against people who are not dealing with a similar disability as me, if they're not a professional athlete, it's still very likely that, you know, I'm going to outperform them. Like I said, I have buddies with no arms and no legs that I know for a fact can swim better and faster than 80% of the people that I personally know who have no physical, you know, ailments or conditions. Um, so just on a professional <laughs> level, they, right? Pro probably, again, I was Yeah, they probably beat me in a, in a heartbeat. I'm, I'm not the there best you go, swimmer. Yeah. And so, and so that, that's my point exactly, right? So yeah, on the professional level, that's just fair sport, right? That's fair sporting. Um, but then outside of that, you know, at the heart of at the heart of sport is is play for sure. Um, but but obviously the higher levels, right? You can't help but have an element of competition. Uh, and for me, a lot of it still comes back down to that competition with self, right? Yeah. Yes. There are other people on the blocks and things like that, but it's like in my mind. That all these guys are really just showing up to find out who's coming in second. Quite <laughs> um, 
I'm here to do what I'm going to do. And that is to be the best possible me that I can be today. And I'm the only one that even has a chance at doing that. So, uh, like I said, for me, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty short answered, man. It's, it's really not this kind of wind about thing. I think it's healthy for people with, um, diverse experiences, whether that be, uh, neurological, um, or, or, or physical or what have you to compete and be in community with everyone, right? All ability levels, I think should have certain levels of interaction hundred percent, especially on a uh, sporting field of play. Um, just because we need to experience that. We all live in the same society. We need to understand, right? Ultimately the values that sports provide us, the ability to be a team member, the ability to, right, have, op have healthy opposition, the ability to set a goal and attain it, the ability to overcome challenges as you are attempting to accomplish that goal. Um, you know, so, so there's just so many life lessons that come in sport that quite frankly would only be, uh, the benefit would only be amplified the more inclusive, right, fields of play are. I mean, it's, it's actually interesting because, you know, you talk about creating an even playing field. I mean, it's for a long time that existed in the sense people would play each other based on their skill level. You know, obviously not everyone is good enough to play in the NBA. So they play up until, mm -hmm. you know, division one college or division three college, mm -hmm. you know, or they only play up to high school mm -hmm. as I did. It's, it's, you know, so it's like that existed for a long time. But I think what's interesting is now in more recent years, mm -hmm. uh, you, um, we're now talking about establishing a playing field, not just based on how good you are as an actual player of your sport, but like what, yep. what might hold you back that you can't control specifically, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, exactly. in the, this case with this disability. And I, I think, you know, as in the case of the Paralympics, that's been very interesting to see in the sense you've got mm -hmm. these athletes like yourself who have these conditions or in other cases don't have arms or legs or whatever and mm -hmm. it's like they're mm -hmm. still competing at you know these these levels that um you know it's like are pretty good and luckily for them because they're on a playing field they actually can have success from that you know so i just think yep. that's that's very interesting to see and uh and i guess before i ask my final question here i would just ask mm. uh first if you have any other thoughts or suggestions about what we've discussed that you'd like to share uh, um uh I'm I'm sure I'm sure to, I'm sure I'll have a chance to 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 throw it in after your final question. Yeah, I mean my final question honestly probably does this better anyway in terms of stimulating whatever you want to say here which is um w w which is whatever that is. So my question here um to to wrap this up as I do every time is although much progress has been made in recent years when we discussed like Paralympics and you know swimming education all that stuff there obviously can still be a stigma associated with challenges like CMT or swimming or whatever. And so my question is, what, uh, what is the one thing that you want someone listening to this podcast to know about your experiences with all these challenges that you've witnessed that they should better understand or appreciate? The biggest thing that I could say is this. Um, human capital is the most valuable commodity that exists. Uh, people want a lot of money ultimately so that they can influence people. <laughs> you know, like I mean, that's, that's how so capitalism cool. works. Yeah, you know, so so even that said, like human capital itself um is the greatest commodity that exists and therefore it's the it's the most challenging thing to harness and to wield i say this to say this number one thing is the ugly truth is whatever you're going through dude the world doesn't care um it may become a hot topic <laughs> and so it's cool to pretend like people care for a little bit you know and and hopefully you can ride that wave uh but but they don't care that said, the best thing and the most important thing for you to do is to understand that the more people that you can get to care, the more impossible it becomes for you and your mission to fail. Because like mm. I said, human capital is the most valuable commodity there is. After you have so many people a part of 
your movement or that care about what you're doing or your disease or your struggle or whatever that after there's so many people vested in this or again this goes into business or, or whatever it is maybe, maybe you're trying to become a pro athlete the more people that you can get to invest in that and that you can continue to refine the less and less likely failure becomes uh but like i said it's no easy feat it's simple but in no way is it easy so my wish to anyone listening to this um who wants to change the perception about some stigma out there or some stereotype number one first and foremost is to be the example hmm. uh because somebody's got to set the example for those people to believe in and um and then do you just go out there and you make them one believer at a time 10 believers at a time 100 believers at a time and if you're true enough and and if you're true enough, I do I do believe if you're true enough, you'll be successful. It might take it will probably take a lot longer than you think, mm. but um, you can get there. No, man, it, it's just like, you know, the process of, you know, influencing people. And, and I go to the University of Texas and their motto is what starts here changes the world. And essentially, like for me, it's like to change the world. It's like you know, it, it comes one person at a time, one day at a time. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, as you touched upon, it's like, it's not even about, you know, um, how much you succeed, because to me, su success is, um, it, it's either, oh, my God, I, I always mix up these terms, I think it's subjective is what it is, like, you're not mm -hmm. trying to accomplish anything specific with your success. You're just trying your best to do something and therefore not fail, as you said, like, you want to lessen the chances of failing more so I would I would argue than of actually quote unquote succeeding because how are you going to mm -hmm. define success? You really just want to do something that makes a difference, however it may be. And, you know, and it can be in a lot of ways, as you pointed out, whether it be encouraging more research on the on a disease or, you know, encouraging more people to know what it even is, you know, mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. things like that, I think can be very important. And, yeah. and I think for you, like you've done a great job, not even just in one field, I might add, but like so many, it's like, you know, you talk yeah, about, we got, man. you talk about CMT, <laughs> you talk about teaching people how to swim, you talk about, you know, having success at the Paralympics and being nominated for an SP. It's like, you know, you bring attention to so many different things um, at once, honestly, that it's like, you know, it's very hard to fail. I would point out it for you. <laughs> so I think, I think you, I think, you know, and I'll, I'll say this, like, you know, you talk about setting the example. I think you've done a very good job at that. <laughs> hey man, well, listen, dude, uh, I'll leave y'all with this. Even, even after such a, such a gleaming uh, and, 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 True, albeit I won't say that you've lied about anything, but like very, you know, um, very kind compliment that you just paid me. Again, it's simple, but it's not easy, dude. You know, like every day, never easy. We all come never. up against the same barrier, right? Regardless of who they are, everyone comes up against a barrier. Like, man, would it be easier to just quit? I mean, and that answer is yes. <laughs> it would be easier to just quit. That answer is a hundred percent yes. Uh, but I just want you people to know that like asking yourself that question doesn't make you a failure. It's when you commit to that being your answer that you become a failure. I mean, that that's a that's a great way to to end this, man. Like, you know, I'll just I'll just say this, man. Failure is not an option here. So failure you know. is not an option. Amen to that, brother. Amen <laughs> to that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jamal, for joining us today. That was awesome. Like that, that's probably one of my shorter interviews I've ever done. And I think that was probably arguably the best one. So credit to you <laughs> awesome, for, for having for having such a great discussion with me. But uh, hopefully, I hope you keep doing what you're doing. Hopefully next year, you'll actually win the SP this time. Um, hey, you know what, man? Oh, fingers crossed. But fingers um, really, my eyes, my eyes are set on a gold medal, dude. You know, it's a... Uh... My eyes, are, my eyes are set on a gold medal at this time. That's that's what's on my bulletin board. So rumor has it they've already got it sitting there for me. 
it's just a bit of a technicality. I have to show up to collect <laughs> it. So uh, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, we'll we'll see you in Paris next summer. So I'll you know. see you in Paris. We oui, we oui, monsieur. Yeah, we oui, we oui, man. I'll be watching, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will be watching too, man. But uh, but thank you so much. That was awesome. Likewise, brother. Thank you, man. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this episode today. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to like and share it with others. And if you're looking for more great content, you can subscribe or follow us on this platform or go to our website at www.sportsonthespectrum.net. And if you think that you'd have a story worth sharing, don't hesitate to fill out a form on our website for the opportunity to be a guest on a future episode. Until then, be sure to stay safe, have fun, get dirty, and I will see you on the next episode of Sports on the Spectrum.